Okay. Um, next up, we have David. Uh, David Toller is a budding entrepreneur, I mean, a uh, kept man, uh, living next to the beach while pursuing his dreams, I mean, uh, delusions of being a successful or rather mad inventor. Uh, with a background in electronics design, embedded software development, and boring software, he can babble, co I mean, uh, coherently discuss a wide range of topics, and he's going to be talking to us about the lessons he's learned from three years of volunteering to teach students code. Uh, please welcome David. Thank you. Um, have, I, have I got my on switch in the right on now? Yes? Yes, excellent, lovely. Um, thank, you, thank you all for coming along. Um, I, I feel doubly privileged that, that you chose to, to attend this session. Um, so, um, I, I've heard that, uh, um, that, that a, a good speaker should, should aim um, to have the people leaving here um, with, with at least one takeaway message. And I'm hoping that um, what, what you walk out with is, is one of these, these three. Um, so I'm, through the vehicle of interesting stories, um, I, I'm just going to go through uh, these, these three points as, um, in the talk. First up, this is a 40 minute ad uh, for CSIRO uh, STEM Professionals in Schools program. Um, <laughs> um, secondly, um, uh, school children uh, of, of today really are our future community members um, and they're also our future colleagues. Um, so their, their initial IT and programming experiences are increasingly uh, occurring in schools and that's setting them up for their future path um, through, through the IT ecosystem. Um, uh, so, and, 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 and thirdly, IT really is a, a complex um, and, and rapidly moving woolly beast. Um, teachers are time poor and, and they specialize in teaching, not in IT. Um, uh, and being human, they're going to tend to take the easier path when they can, and, and that's not always going to be the best. Um, so getting involved in supporting uh, teachers and schools um, is, is going to lead to quite obviously better outcomes um, for us uh, as well as for them. So very briefly, my, my background, um, three years ago, I moved to the Geelong region for my partner's work, um, had my, my sea change moment. Um, <clears throat> I embarked on a career uh, working from home. Um, I, I live in a small town um, and uh, not, having, not having that, that, that work interaction and, and colleagues was, was going to be quite isolated. Um, so right from the start, um, I set about volunteering in a number of ways one of which was, was in schools, to, to engage with my community, um, to, to get to know um, people, what's going on, um, and honestly just to get out of the house on a regular basis. Um, so I volunteered with the, the CSIRO um, STEM Professionals in Schools program, um, or as it was known at the time, uh, CSIRO Scientists in Schools. Um, <coughs> and, and CSIRO really handles all of the annoying stuff about volunteering in schools for you. Um, so all of the paperwork, uh, the permission, the agreement from the school, um, the working with children check, um, all, all of that sort of stuff is very, very nicely, very simply taken care of uh, for you by the CSIRO. They also run occasional group sessions um, in, in major cities, which I, I haven't attended, but primarily, they're a matchmaking service. <clears throat> so you provide what you offer, um, your skills, your interests. Um, so, so I specifically wanted regular weekly contact, um, which I understand is the most common way that CSIRO lines up the volunteering. Um, but it's not the only way. Other, other models include short, sort of one week or, or one lesson, specialized sessions, um, uh, taking students through um, somebody's field. Um, or working with a, a small group of advanced students for a month or a term um, on a, a, a sort of a stretch project. Um, and the teachers basically do the same. They, they highlight what they're, what they're looking for. Um, and the CSRO team um, matches uh, the two sets of desires uh, and, um, uh, and, and sort of makes sure that you're in the same city, uh, things like that. And if you have a match, they provide the contact details uh, to each other, um, and then you uh, you arrange a date. Uh, so 
I was matched with, with an IT teacher uh, from the local public high school. Um, he's a tall gentleman, um, annoyingly fit, uh, rides a motorbike. Um, we, we had a coffee date uh, at, at the, the local cafe. He paid. Um, <coughs> and, and we came up with a, a regular arrangement where, where once a week I would go in um, and I would volunteer uh, with a double class, um, which goes for about an hour and a half. So it was, it was about two hours total out of my week um, to do this each week. So I started with a, a semester of year 10 and then year 9 students. Um, um, and and they, were, they were quite lovely. We wrapped up year 9 and I, I got a nice card uh, from, from the students. Um, and then I went on and I did two years of a combined uh, year 11, year 12 class. Um, the year 12 was sort of split off in an attached uh, small room. Um, and they really, they, they were my, my focus. Um, the rewards were a little less tangible. Um, I got blanked by an ex-student uh, working in a local restaurant uh, when I said hello. Um, but the work was interesting. It was varied. It, it, it's definitely worthwhile. And, and I'm, I've signed up to, to start doing it again next week. Um, so, yeah. So, <coughs> so, so in, in the introduction... I, I talked briefly about the importance um, of children to, to our community, um, by, by which I'm meaning us here today. Um, and, and I think it's a bit overblown in, in the common media, but, but we really do need to recognise um, that their initial IT uh, experiences and their initial programming experiences are quite different um, to what yours probably were. Um, uh, and, and the most significant recent change um, has been through the, the introduction of the, the National Digital Technology Curriculum um, that, that's come through. Um, so, so the National Curriculum was introduced to students um, in 2016. Um, for, for those in the Education Mini Conference, um, Ian did a, a nice um, uh, overview of, of what that means, particularly for the, the younger years. Um, I, I'm not going to uh, repeat, but, but sort of look at it at a slightly different angle. Um, so the National Digital Curriculum is fantastic. Um, it's not just confined to, to IT classes. Um, in grade three, uh, they introduce linear thinking through um, sort of a logo turtle-like robot. Um, grade five, they, they start doing basic project management uh, work. Um, uh, and, and they might get introduced to graphical programming using Scratch or, or Blockly, something like that. Uh, programming starts in grade six or seven. Um, this is before electives. So every single child will finish high school having done some level of programming. Um, and, and I think the impact of this um, going forward is going to be really quite fascinating. Um, even, even things like... Um, the use of VBScript in office environments um, is probably going to be quite different when, when everyone's actually seen a bit of code before and they're not scared of it, not as scared of it. Um, anyway, so Victoria, uh, we do things slightly differently down there. Um, <coughs> education is, of course, a state matter. Um, so uh, so the, the national digital curriculum um, isn't actually used. We, we use the Victorian digital curriculum, which is based on the national digital curriculum. So we claim we've adopted it, but we've changed it slightly because, you know, we're Victorian. Um, <clears throat> New South Wales has done the same thing. Um, but of course, they've changed it in different ways. Um, so what I'm going to discuss um, is the Victorian uh, implementation of the national digital curriculum, because it's the one that I'm, I'm familiar with. Um, and, and the other thing is that the the national curriculum only goes up to year 10. Um, so Victoria has extended this uh, for the year 11 and year 12 um, program. Um, but the year 12, 11, 12, is, it's, it's very important to look at um, because the year 12 curriculum is much more specific in what they have to do and the skills that they have to learn than the earlier years. Um, so what happens in practice is that the teachers effectively backport the skills needed in 11, 12 
down to the earlier years, so they're setting themselves up. Um, <clears throat> so the, the nice broad things you see in the national curriculum don't really work when you have a specific year 11, year 12 um, curriculum. Um, also, we're looking at a 10-year implementation time frame for this curriculum. Um, so, so as I said, it starts in grade three. Um, so it's going to take about 10 years for the kids to get through um, and until we get kids leaving year 12 who have gone right through this, this course. Um, also, the teachers need to be trained up. You know, teachers are um, they're not specialists um, or, or they're, they're specialist primary school teachers. They're not specialist IT teachers. Um, and they need to, to go through training to get familiar with uh, the things that they need to do and, and to get comfortable so that they actually do deliver it. Um, but I do think um, when this is all done, the, a, a child who chooses to do IT in 11 and 12 in Victoria and does really well um, will end up with probably a quarter um, of the knowledge that I got going through a university IT degree. Um, and, and what that means in terms of what the universities cover in the future, for example, um, is, is really going to be quite, quite interesting and I think very positive. Um, in the long term. So, so up until year 10, curriculum really is a guide for teachers. Um, in a year 11 and 12, it binds them. Um, so, so when I started volunteering, um, one of the things that I wanted to achieve, um, one of my, my personal goals, um, was to try and shift students from being programmers um, to developers. So um, I, I wanted to, to introduce things like automated testing, um, uh, version control, um, bug tracking, uh, all those things that, that take you the step beyond just writing code um, to being what I consider to being a developer um, and, and interacting with other um, developers. Um, and I've largely failed in doing that. Um, because in year 12, they must create and use manual testing tables. Um, this is basically a spreadsheet where you have your, your test, um, your, your test setup, um, your test steps, um, your expected results, and then what you actually got in your results. Um, and they have to do these. They're assessed on creating these, and they're on the exam. Um, and, and while automated testing tends to be unit testing, and this is more integration testing, and they are different things, um, at the level that we're talking about, the distinction's too close. So we can't really teach them automated testing and then expect them to learn this other stuff and use it in the exam and ignore the automated testing that they've used all the way through. It just doesn't work. So we just don't do automated testing. Um, if in year 12, the focus really is on that final mark, um, for better or worse. Um, the student is evaluated with a number at the end of the year, and the teacher is also evaluated by that number. Um, so, so if it's on the curriculum, it gets taught. If it's not on the curriculum, it's a distraction, and we don't, don't get near it. Um, there's some scope with advanced students, but, but much more in year 11 and year 10, um, where you have a bit more, a bit more flexibility. So, so just very, very briefly, I know I've, I've talked a bit about this because um, I do feel it's quite important. Um, what they cover in Victoria um, is, is project management. Um, so the year 12 course, um, they, do, they do a project. Um, it's remarkably similar to, to what I did as a group thing um, in my third year of university. They, they go through a basic waterfall system where they do, um, they, they get a, a project brief um, they produce a specification, um, they create a design um, with a variety of design documents, then they produce a program, then they do testing, um, all that kind of thing. Um, something that we struggle to impart to them is that what they produce doesn't actually matter as anywhere near as much as going through the steps and the documentation that they produce to produce the product, um, which is not the fun half. Um, but um, but yeah, so the, they go through this and they um, it, it very much is a simplified process compared to what you learn at university using the ISO standards. Um, and I struggle quite a bit because they use uh, 
specific terminology, which is not what I was taught. Um, but um, uh, they also they have to learn XML, read, write, CSV. Um, they must do GUIs. Terribly annoying. Um, and also because um, uh, the government doesn't specify which programming language they have to learn um, for the exams, um, they have to read and write pseudocode. Um, and there is a right way, apparently, of doing pseudocode. Um, and it's an awful lot like Visual Basic. Um, um, the other side um, is, is, is up there. Um, I, I really do, do think that, that knowing this sort of stuff, it's, it's useful if you're bringing in people, particularly straight out of school, um, as, as staff or, or as contributors. Um, so for example, they'll be able to write code, but they'll have no familiarity um, with the common object-orientated design patterns. Because object-orientated theory um, and, and concepts like inheritance are entirely absent from the curriculum. Um, they'll be able to do testing, um, but it won't be the automated or unit testing. Um, and they'll be quite attached to things like formal design processes, but, but not at all familiar with bug trackers. Um, and, and finally, um, they don't do any group work. So they, they'll have never read or interacted with somebody else's code. Um, they, they'll have never done a code review of their code. Um, it, it's very much an individual um, course um, that, that we go through. <coughs> so um, teachers, in the generic sense, um, really are just like the rest of us. Um, they want to do a good job. Um, but, but they're pressed for time. Um, and despite, despite what they display to students, they really are learning on the job as, as they go through. Um, so like everyone else, they'll take shortcuts and they'll use props um, if they can. Um, they have um, dedicated tools that they use. Um, there's mailing lists, reference sources, um, uh, conferences. Um, um, all, all these resources are, are really critical because it determines how they teach what they teach, which strongly influences what they teach. Um, so, so the tool that, that we rely on most heavily um, is, is Grok. Um, Grok is developed uh, in Sydney. Um, and I don't, I don't recognize any Grokers in the audience, but they certainly are here at the conference. Um, so Grok's an online program. Uh, it teaches people how to code. Um, it's similar but significantly better to, to Code Academy, which is a, a free online um, system. Um, you have to pay uh, per user uh, to use this, um, but, but they have introduced some government support. Um, and Grok provides guided lessons um, uh, that take people through um, uh, basic Python. Um, there's an interactive editor. Um, it's got a built-in compiler and tester, um, and, and there's a back end that allows the teacher to track the progress of each student in the class as, as they go through. Um, I just, I'm, I'm going to have a, a diversion for just a moment um, for, from talking about strictly IT, because I do think this is terribly important. Um, I went to a private school in Canberra. Um, and for those of you who don't really know Canberra, it's, it's a privileged environment as well. Um, everyone that I knew at school could read um, to a really solid high uh, level. Um, I understood that some people couldn't read. You know, I read about it in the newspaper. Um, but I, I didn't really understand. I, I didn't really understand what that meant. Um, where I'm currently volunteering, um, it's a public school. Um, in a low socioeconomic area, uh, which is code for full of poor people. Um, and, and literacy um, is, is worse than average, but not hugely so. Um, so the, the graph that I've got up here, um, the blue line is the national average. Um, the red line is the school that, that I volunteer at. Um, and uh, the government says that the, the minimum standard um, for, uh, for students um, at grade nine um, is, is a level six 
uh, rating bend. Um, and, and, and what this, this means in practice is that in a standard class of 30 students, um, four people can't read to a workable level. They can write their name, they can read a menu, <clears throat> but they can't tackle and comprehend paragraphs of information. Um, and it's kind of unsurprising that these students don't do well um, with self-guided learning. Um, so, which isn't to say these students are stupid. You know, I, um, I sat down with a, drug, a struggling student for a full double lesson um, uh, one day. Um, with, with guidance, um, he could write code, fine. He could comprehend the instructions as I relayed to him. Uh, sort of verbally pass them on to him um, without any sort of issue. Um, but he couldn't continue that work um, by himself. He couldn't continue to drive that through. Um, and, it, and it triggered me to, to have a discussion with the teacher about, about this and, and what was going on in the school um, and, and to reflect quite a bit on, um, on what that meant and, and how, how I should sort of handle it working forward. And the conclusion that I came to is that literacy really is required in our field. Um, if you're a programmer, understanding APIs, um, reading large amounts of documentation, um, even just reading Stack Overflow, um, it really does require absorbing large amounts of textual information quite quickly. Um, But we should be caring about this literacy problem um, because it does go beyond computer science to, to English. Um, it corresponds to about 10% of the population. Um, and they're your users. And they're going to really struggle as users because our UI designs assume that you can skim read large amounts of words. And they can't. Um, yeah. So the teacher is a big fan of self-guided learning. Um, essentially what we do is we, we, we set kids up with a resource like, like Grok um, and we let them work through it uh, largely at their own pace. Um, we, we circulate and we provide assistance, um, which is basically my job. It, it's kind of fun. You get lots of little challenges as you, um, as you interact and help each student um, comprehend and, and guide them through um, guide them through understanding and breaking down the, the problem that they're working on. Um, I, 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 another story, I, um, I, I was working with a, um, a younger class um, that, that I only visited once, uh, unfortunately. Um, and one of the students in particular during the introduction um, understood that, that I was there to do the work there for them. Um, so, um, so as I tried to guide them through, basically they played dumb because they really wanted me to do the work for them. Um, and, and with guidance, she got it and she understood what she was doing. Um, but, but for this particular student, there was this, this very strong fear of failure um, and very reluctant to, to work solo. Um, and, and I have to confess, by, by the end of an hour and a half of working around the group, um, they wore me down. Um, and, and I did end up, uh, at the end, um, just sitting down and, and doing it. Um, but the, the, the interactions you have with each student and the, the little challenges of um, dealing with the way all of them work, um, really, is, it's quite a lot of fun. It's quite, it's quite fascinating. Um, and the, the teacher. Um, it ensures that they stay on task, um, that they actually do the work. Um, and there is, <coughs> there is a hidden feature, um, actually, um, that, that I wanted to, to mention at this point um, with, with Grok that, that I showed earlier. Um, so Grok, Grok teaches Python, um, which means that we teach the students Python. Um, and it, 
it's a bit simplistic to, to put it that way. Um, you know, we, we chose Grok because they taught Python and, and, and the, the two went together. But Grok's doing a huge favor to, to the open source and to the Python community um, by, by teaching that and providing the resources to teachers um, to, to teach that. Because if, if there wasn't a system like Grok available, we wouldn't teach Python. You know, if, if there were those systems and tools for JavaScript, for example, um, we might teach JavaScript. Um, but, you know, the, the, when you look at the curriculum, there's, there's a lot of positive things about that. Um, so, so having groups like, um, like the, the, the Grok collection of companies um, really is very important um, for, for producing... Um, Python programmers in the future. Because, of course, Grok's not the only way of doing it. Um, Microsoft provides considerable resources to guide students in their direction. Um, uh, in, my, in my first year, um, I, I guided the students um, in using a, a system called Small Basic. Um, part of the reason that the teacher got me in was to, to try and migrate away from this. It's a small basic, it's a, it's a cut down version of basic designed for, for kids. Um, Microsoft provides it for free. Um, there's 14 keywords in the language. Um, very simple to, to understand and use. Um, comes with uh, libraries to, to interact with the console, with the GUI, um, a logo, um, driver, a turtle around, draw a box type, type work as well. And it comes with a, a Visual Studio style IDE uh, with IntelliSense. Um, and, and those nice features. Um, it's not fantastic. There's a, there's a few slight issues. There's GoTo, um, which they advise students to use. Um, all variables are, are globals. Um, there are functions, but functions don't take arguments, and they don't return anything, because, of course, all variables are globals, so why need to? Um, <clears throat> but, but the big thing about small basic is that Microsoft provides it with a lesson plan and exercises. Um, targeted for each age group. Um, so, so for a teacher, um, all they need to do is, is download Small Basic, download the lesson plan for 14 year olds, um, and it's broken down lesson by lesson. This is what you cover, this is how you cover it, um, this is what you provide students. It's, it's very, very simple and very attractive um, to, to teachers. Um, and then Small Basic naturally guides students um, into Visual Basic in their later years. Um, and most Year 12 students in Victoria use Visual Basic. Um, and, and the curriculum, the curriculum best matches Visual Basic. Um, so, so Microsoft is pumping a huge amounts of, resor huge amounts of resources into this sector. Um, and, and there is a, a deliberate goal of guiding people through to um, their .NET development ecosystem. Um, uh, as another example, um, Microsoft released the Minecraft Education Edition um, just one year after um, they spent two and a half billion dollars acquiring Minecraft. Um, you know, it, it very much is a focus of um, the organisation um, and what they want to do. So. This isn't a call to arms. You know, I'm, not, I'm not suggesting that we all get together and we write a textbook. Um, the, the textbooks are rubbish. Um, but we, we as a community, we already produce this stuff. Um, this, this image, um, every single one of these is a Python library um, designed to make using TK Inter um, easier, um, easier to learn, easier to use. Um, and the ones in red, um, uh, were designed specifically uh, to help people learn Python. Um, so <clears throat> so we, we are already doing this, and some of it's being done for or, or, or by um, teachers. Um, and, and the teachers find this stuff, and they share it with each other um, through their, um, their private networks. Um, and, and we should just be aware of it. Um, and, and, and offer to help if asked, um, because they do sometimes have very specific requirements 
um, of, of things like um, the, the GUI toolkits. Um, you know, larger projects should be open to, to requests like that. Because um, I think, like usability, um, making things easier to learn actually benefits everyone who uses the, the ecosystem. Um, otherwise, somebody else with a, a different vested interest um, will provide um, the tools that teachers require. Um, so thank you for listening. Um, I've, I've gone through why um, IT in schools is important, um, uh, why we should care, and why we should get involved in this. Um, hopefully, I, I've inspired you to uh, contact the CSIRO and sign up for the STEM Professionals in Schools program. Um, and yes, does anyone have any questions? Um, uh, right, sorry. Um, so the, the question was around um, Code Club and um, Raspberry Pi usage um, in schools and that, that sort of um, ecosystem. Um, and and how, have I been involved? And the, the, the opening answer is no. Um, I, live, I live in a smaller town. Um, it, is, it is considered remote. Um, and we don't have... Uh, code clubs accessible to, to our students. Um, we do, the school does provide a robotics course um, where they would like to use Raspberry Pis, um, but for reasons not worth discussing, um, can't. Um, uh, yeah, because they're not good reasons. Um, can't um, use those. Um, I, I am aware that, um, for example, the, the BBC Microbit um, has been used quite a bit. Um, but it targets students at a lower level. Um, the, the year 10, 11, 12, um, they really do have to work with um, uh, a, they, they really do have to work with a full featured language like Python. Um, and because there's a requirement or, or guidance, uh, because we believe there's a requirement for them to create GUIs, um, working with a, Working with a, a Raspberry Pi or an embedded board doesn't work because you need to create this, you know, you need to have a GUI interface that, that people interact with. So um, a mechanical interface doesn't work, doesn't count. Um, so yeah, there's, there's limitations in what we can do there. Yeah. Yeah. Right, so, so the, the question was about um, the, the reading literacy and the, the problem with having students below, um, below the threshold um, that, that I mentioned um, and, and how, how we work to support those students. Um, this isn't going to sound good, but we don't. Um, in a class of 30 students, um, by the time that the child gets to grade 9 or 10, um, we, we don't do that. We don't, um, if, if a child has gotten to year 10 and is doing an IT class and isn't able to read, the IT teacher can't devote significant resources to teaching them how to read. Um, it's horrible. It, it's, I really wish it wasn't the case, um, but, but it's not the place. Um, uh, so, Effectively, we abandon the kids um, because to do otherwise would significantly affect the other 26 students. Um, yeah, it's, it's a big problem. Um, I, I don't know what the solution is. Um, I don't feel the solution is doing it in IT classes. Um, it might help. Um, but yeah, no, the, the horrible reality is that we basically we abandon them. And my understanding 
is that, that that's what happens in most classes. Okay. Um, so, so the the question was, um, um, uh, sorry, I, I didn't get your name. Um, that that um, uh, how best to support um, teachers in rural, remote communities, um, and and I'm not sure about sort of deep remote. Um, I'm I'm half an hour out of Geelong. Um, you know we. We are considered remote, um, but but you know Melbourne's two hours away. Um, uh, I I don't know. I mean I understand even in even in real, rural remote communities, um, they they're still doing things like um, providing every child with laptops. Um, they have the the physical resources. Um, I, I think the the limitation particularly with smaller schools, is that, that they don't have the dedicated teachers, um, that, that a maths teacher trying to teach IT is, is obviously not going to have the same skill level as a dedicated IT teacher. Um, how to fix that without scale is, I don't know. I don't know. Um, it's difficult. Um, and, and ongoing training is, um, is hard, and the, the schools have limited budgets for providing ongoing training. Um, there's, yeah, I have no, no pleasant answers, I'm afraid. Um, yeah. Please. What kind of personality traits do you think are helpful or necessary if you <coughs> want to engage that kind of volunteering? Right, the, the question was what sort of personality traits are helpful or, or beneficial if you're uh, volunteering in, in schools. Um, uh, patience is good. Um, <laughs> Um, I, I really, I, I don't think anything is necessary. You know, you, um, you interact with people, you interact with students the way you interact with people and, um, um, you know, you've, whatever your personality, you've learnt some way of doing that. Um, um, I, I think a bit of creativity is also quite useful. Um, it, it's quite, it's quite an interesting challenge to, um, um, Woohoo! Um, to to try and um, uh, take what a child's done. Um, so so quite often when you're looking at their code, there's an obvious flaw in there um, that they've e either conceptually done something wrong or or um, broken down the problem in career. Like there's when, when you look at it, you know exactly how to fix it, um, and then you have to step back and try and figure out how do you get student like. How did they get to that point, and how do you get them to realise that that they need to be getting somewhere else? Um, and um, and and yes, the the sort of um, problem solving ability to sort of step sideways, um, I found um, important and, and quite challenging, um, actually. To yeah, people people do some weird things. Yeah. Um, so the, the question was, is there, is there any way through the internet for, for people in urban communities to help remote communities? Um, not that I'd recommend. Um, I, I would just suggest help, help where you live. You know, um, rural communities, they're pretty much, they're fine. To be honest, like, um, they're not that much worse off. Uh, you know, if you, if you live, where, where you live, there will be students who need assistance. Um, and, and you're going to, you're going to find it much more rewarding, um, and, and probably do a much better job to, to help the people in your in your community. Um, yeah. Sorry.
Yep. Yes, yes, thank you. So, um, yes, Code the Future, competition to CSIRO. Um, and yes. and, sorry? Thanks, Matt, and thanks for being a session chair too. Um, the point that I think we're coming to here is that there are a lot of different organisations like Code the Future, Code Club, there's several others, the um, STEM program from CSIRO, who all look to developers to help out, but it's all on a volunteer basis and you're all contending for the same resources, developer resources. <sighs> I don't mean to be you know, rude about this, but the lack of resourcing in schools, the inequity that we see in schools, the NAPLAN scores that we see in schools, I'm, I'm from Geelong and I, I live in a very low socioeconomic area and I, I see this firsthand. It seems to me that this is a government policy problem that developers are now being expected to, <coughs> to solve. That's my perspective. Sorry, Mark. Yes, thank you. Um, but you know, if you are if you are a developer, it's kind of fun. Um. Oh, 
I've just got a quick question. Um, you listed the things that were happening in years 11 and 12 and the things that you saw that weren't happening. Yep. Um, as a sort of, I guess, professional software developer, I'm seeing the same things that you're saying. Um, what do you suggest that we can do about that <laughs> as a community to more closely align what's being taught, especially in grades 11 and 12, with what's actually happening in the software development industry? Do you have any thoughts or suggestions what we might do? Um, I, I would like us, uh, I, I would like more professional input to the curriculum drawing up. Um, it's, it's, it's thorny, um, particularly because the, the, the issues that I highlighted are um, they very much they're introduced in the Victorian Year 11, 12 curriculum. Um, they're not present in the National Digital Curriculum. Um, in my view, the National one is really quite well put together. Um, and then the Victorian one was less so. Um, so yeah, certainly when, um, when the curriculums get reviewed or um, get redrawn up, um, I would certainly be planning on putting in a submission um, and, and would encourage, would encourage you um, to, to keep an eye out in your state um, and do the same. Because um, I do think, uh, I, I, I do think a bit of object oriented theory would be more useful um, than dealing with the details of XML or whatever CSV happens to actually be. That's all we have time for, unfortunately. Um, so I'd like to thank you, David, for your time. Thank you. And give you a gift. Thank you very much. Thank you.